Yes. Good morning. Um, as Carla said, I'm going to talk about uh, military uh, and state aircraft certification within EOSA. It's a bit closer, maybe. Better so? Yes, I think so. Uh, and what might come up with the new basic regulation? <coughs> uh, first, let's have a short look from of, on where we're coming from. We have for many years been working on different kind of uh, platforms that are used both in civil and uh, military, uh, like the CASA 212s, uh, 295, 235s, uh, as well as uh, the SEAL 215, which is a dedicated water bomber, but uh, with, a, uh, some, with that almost only flying as a state aircraft. Uh, Air for A400M is also a good example. Uh, and for SDCs, we have uh, the A330 MRTT aircrafts, which uh, can make an example. We've also been uh, touching uh, different kind of uh, aircraft for uh, firefighting, uh, police, uh, and uh, Coast Guard and those kind of aircraft. And uh, here, touching is maybe the word, because we have always been stopping at some point where you actually put on the power on those special mission systems that have been where we have stopped. <coughs> uh, and uh, also, if you look at operations until now, the operations of those aircraft have been outside of the EASA scope. They have been on the national authorities. <coughs> uh, and where are we going? Uh, we are going now to a situation where the uh, power on might not be the the final step for us, uh, and uh, the operators, the states, will have the possibility to opt in their air state aircraft into the air support uh, M system, um, and for sure this will need that EASA will need to have a more, much more holistic approach on those kind of aircrafts. Um, where are we not going? Yeah, for sure, uh, fighters flying uh, supersonic with afterburners is clearly out of the new scope the, of the new uh, basic regulation, uh, no matter how fun we might think they are. <laughs> <coughs> okay, uh, why is the new basic regulation amended? Uh, this comes from the European Commission and the Aviation Strategy for Europe and uh, intend to make better use of the limited sources we have in Europe, uh, flexible, provide for a flexible and performance-based system, and closing some gaps and inconsistencies. And this would end up with a comprehensive, flexible system, which is better adapted to new challenges. <coughs> and uh, if we look at the timeline, I don't know if you have followed the development of the discussions on the, the base regulation, but, uh, at the moment now, the basic regulation is, is uh, now is in Brussels and uh, are looked at there. And we expect an entry into force of it during 2018. And after that, we will start uh, writing the uh, implementing rules for it. <coughs> Since the current wording is not yet published, since it's not uh, uh, it enforced, there might be some uh, changes still. So I will not show the full text, but I will give you some keywords, which I still think even if that they will still stay more or less the same. For the opt-in of the aircraft, the new basic regulation says that, uh, we'll say, uh, that the member state may consider to apply the provision of this regulation. It's an application they do. They apply to put this into the, under the EASA scope. And um, more also important is that the Commission are the ones deciding on such request. Uh, and it also says that the member states making use of this possibility should cooperate with the European Union Aviation Safety Agency, that's us, uh, so that the aircraft and activities concerned uh, comply with relevant provisions of this regulation, being the new basic regulation. So, it's actually a, uh, not necessarily that 
we will accept, or the Commission will accept, that the state obtain their aircraft. <coughs> Uh, and this is the question then, will those military stars fit into the very square DOS regulations? Um, and here the important thing is that the opt-in is voluntary. Uh, so when the state choose to opt-in their aircraft into the OSA system, uh, they need to follow the regulations we have. And uh, the main reason for this is that cherry picking is not part of the core business which we are doing here. So they need to fit into the square. <coughs> but we also have then some consideration on the author side. We need, need to internally look at the know-how we have because we will have new technology coming in which we are not uh, known, known with. Uh, maybe very well known by the state, by the operators, by the ones uh, doing the installations, but maybe new to us. We need to look at the other resources. We don't know yet how much uh, workload this will add on us. Uh, fees and charges, of course, need to have some kind of overview. And most importantly, we need to clarify the prerequisites before the opt-in. Uh, and the implementing rules for the opt-in, which uh, you had on the previous slide also. Uh, and to be fully prepared for the future scenarios, uh, we have established something we call the, the EOSA military coordination mechanism, that they are now looking to what will come in the future. Uh, <clears throat> with that said, we are already today working in the spirit of the new basic regulation. Uh, and then we have uh, the A330, MRTT and FSTA, for example, which are dual-use platforms in, uh, in some sense. And so we are already touching those kind of areas. <coughs> and um, what will the impact then be? Well, if you look at the op operations, the operations for state aircraft, military aircraft, often are a bit outside of the box from the TSID aircraft. Uh, you can imagine a Dash 8 uh, that normally flies 50 minutes uh, commuter flights up to cruising altitude and then landing somewhere. Uh, now you take the same Dash 8, uh, you use it for uh, Coast Guard uh, operations, you uh, fly over the Baltic Sea a stormy Saturday night in a search, search and rescue operation on 500 feet, flaps down to reduce the speed. Um, you as DOA need to anticipate those kind of, uh, those kind of uh, operations because I mean, the, the flaps are not used, uh, designed for such operations. They are designed for the blue line. Uh, and this is something you need to understand. And uh, um, another thing, I mean, is it anyone here in this room that ever added to their maintenance program that you need to wash the engines after a, a flight over sea on low level? Uh, it's uh, something also to consider. Flying low, you get salt into the engines and uh, this actually reduces the engine life. Um, <coughs> also, we at the engines, you need to understand those kind of operations. We are not anticipating them in our regulations, so we also need to work on it. Uh, another example could be uh, the, an in-flight refueling aircraft. It goes up to uh, its cruising altitude, flies somewhere, uh, supposed to meet up with a fighter, descend to some another altitude uh, to do the refueling operations, and they might do this a couple of times during their mission. And of course, the pressurized airframe will have more cycles than uh, anticipated in the design. Interesting is also if you have a du dual use aircraft that uh, maybe are used uh, for civil purposes, flying airlines, uh, and that at some point you take this aircraft in, you make a campaign on it and modify it for uh, the military use and fly it military for some time and then you might take it back into the civil uh, register. Uh, and then you need to, as the UA, need to figure out how to transfer those cycles into your, between the two uh, operations. 
put it short, the DOA need to take the intended operation into the consideration and compare it with the awareness limitation issued by the TC holder. Uh, and of course, present this to the agency when you do the application. <coughs> I will give you a very short example of what you can uh, uh, expect to have. Uh, this is an uh, actual example from a special mission aircraft. Uh, at some point, this crack was discovered uh, the wing, in the wings bar. Uh, the wings bar was uh, removed and um, uh, a new one was put in place. And the old one was sent to lab laboratory. And uh, at the residual strength test, the wings bar actually cracked at 3.57 G. Uh, and due to this, the maintenance program for this fleet were changed uh, because uh, it was calculated that the crack propagation from the minimum uh, uh, detectable crack would go to failure with about 3,000 hours. So uh, the inspection program was added with a visual inspection 300 hours and an NDT every 1,000 hours, which you wouldn't expect necessarily on a wings bar on under normal operations. <coughs> Uh, when it comes to certification, uh, we also expect a wider scope. Uh, you look at this, and I know some of you here are already working with those kind of installations uh, on the aircraft. But uh, big, and I would expect on a search and rescue for ex aircraft, for example, you would have big antennas, you would have flare turrets, uh, surveillance radars, direction finders, and those would then trigger maybe the creep for large antennas, you would have uh, structural uh, implications on it, uh, performance might be uh, affected. Uh, on uh, lasers, for example, we have a, a certification memo on lasers. Uh, at the end of this, my presentation, there will be some links to some uh, certification memos and special conditions. Uh, for um, uh, radar jammers and for uh, electronic warfare stuff and uh, all those computers you can uh, anticipate in uh, such an aircraft, you would also need to look at the electrical load analysis very carefully. Uh, when it comes to radar jammers, maybe even the hearth environment of the aircraft could be affected when you start uh, emitting uh, uh, power out. Um, for uh, medevac aircraft, you often have uh, very much oxygen on board. Uh, for patients, so there the, our uh, oxygen hazard creep would be uh, applicable and you would, would need to look at uh, uncontained rotor failure as well. Um, we also have a lot of uh, cabin configuration which are a bit unique uh, and here I would say that for example uh, emergency access path, firm handhold, uh, cabin crew view, are a few examples where uh, we would stretch uh, what can be allowed. Um, <coughs> and let's look a bit about the experience so far. Uh, with the project, we have this in, in this uh, area. We realized that they are very complex. Uh, the A400MTC, for example, I think we can consider that being one of the very most complex projects we ever had in, within EASA. Uh, all those this, uh, uh, projects often lead to very unique discussions. Um, <coughs> and as I said before, when you go into the area of opting in the aircraft, you need to start discussing very early and uh, make sure that we understand what you're doing. Um, and also, part 21 must be complied with, that's uh, baseline. Uh, for uh, some military project, we have developed a very unique crease, some crease that can only be applied on a military uh, application. Uh, this is especially in the area of uh, cabin uh, related changes. Uh, and those crees are written with certain assumptions about which kind of uh, operation, which kind of people that are on board, uh, and outlining the limitations around this to try to make also those uh, operations uh, equally safe. 
Uh, and when it comes to cabin changes, I can give you a hint. You working with an aircraft with an old certification basis, but please have a look at uh, Amendment 19 and Appendix S, because there uh, there are some uh, new things. Uh, but there you must remember that the Appendix S comes as a package. There's no kind of uh, possibility to just uh, elect to comply to parts of it. <coughs> uh, and the discussion, discussions about the crease are always very project unique. So two things to consider for you is the novelty of what you install uh, and how you present this approach to EASA. Please do this. We talked about this yesterday in the site meeting for cabin changes. Please come up with what you have very early. Be prepared to have meetings and, and, uh, and uh, describe it to us because even if you know all those uh, special equipments, we are not familiar to them. So please initiate those discussions very early so we don't run into the surprises in the end. Uh, and I just want to mention also that for some uh, TC, uh, STCs where we have, for example, a uh, um, uh, maritime surveillance aircraft where uh, there's more or less the same installations are done uh, with small changes between the customers, but on the same type, we have issued a, a supplementary type uh, data sheet, uh, STCDS, uh, to enhance the configuration control of those changes. And then it, your kind of type would be treated as, have a similar uh, document as you have for a TCDS for a type certificate. Um, very shortly, uh, some, consider some considerations for the DOAs. Uh, you need to think about the instruction for continued awareness. There must, might be aspects you haven't thought about in, in the very first glance when you look at it. Uh, you need to consider how to present the unusual design features for us and how to sh show compliance for them. Uh, please prepare for a bit longer lead times than you are used to, even if you think that the normal STCs are, per definition, taking too long time. Those um, special mission uh, STCs might take even longer. Uh, Prepare for maybe not more crease, but different crease than you are used to, because uh, this is not as, often not as simple as a radar altimeter or something. Uh, and also prepare for more test activity, te test activities than you are used to, since uh, some of those equipments you need to uh, show compliance on the platform, since uh, there are no other uh, previous. Um, compliance for the, your equipment. Um, and there you will have the links to the uh, cert uh, certification memos. This will be published on the website later, I understand. And I think that was it. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Johan. Um, we are a bit behind, but I think uh, this uh, topic really deserves at least one question from the audience, and we received many. Uh, yeah, we received some questions. Uh, one question uh, was about the fact that you mentioned initial awareness approval, of course. Uh, for those opt-in uh, projects, uh, will continue the awareness be covered by EASA too? Well, uh, I wouldn't even like to guess on that. As I said, we haven't seen the final basic regulations yet. We haven't seen the implementing rules yet. So I think that will be something we will present next year. Thank you.